Good evening. Um, hello and welcome to everyone that's joining us at CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies and also those that are participating on the live stream for today's program, Legacies of Organizing at CUNY, The Power of Collective Action. I'm Sarah Watson, director of the Murphy Institute here at SLU. For those of us gathered here at SLU, we are meeting on the traditional and stolen territory of the Lenape people who were forcibly displaced through a process of settler colonialism that continues today. I recognize the Lenape as the right, rightful stewards for this land and pay respect to their elders past, present, and to future generations. And I ask we take a moment to consider the legacies of violence, displacement, and migration that bring us together here today and to recognize the ongoing collective work towards dismantling settler colonialism. As a longtime CUNY employee and twice CUNY grad, I'm so looking forward to our program um, and extremely grateful to our speakers, Marissa, Connor, Kazembe, and our moderator, James, for being here to share in conversation. Um, before I introduce our moderator, James Rodriguez, I wanna thank the many folks at SLU whose labor made this program possible. Zara Cadeau, who co-organized the program with me, the public engagement team, Woo! the public engagement team, Michael, Nadia, and Rose, the communications and IT teams, especially Aaron, Sean, Calvin, and Tariq, and the facilities team, especially Keisha and our custodial staff, Hector and Marta. I also want to share about two upcoming programs this Friday, April 12th. We will be continuing to think about movement histories as we co-present with Fordham University, the conference Social Movement Histories and Practice, Oral History, Political Education, and Art. Um, and that will also be available on live stream, but will be in person here at CUNY SLU. And next Thursday at noon on Zoom, we have a lecture by DeWeston Haywood, Associate Professor of History at Hunter College, and this is co-sponsored by the LGBTQIA Consortium and the Blackmail Initiative. Uh, turning to today's program, uh, the event will offer several opportunities for audience participation, uh, with the first chance for dialogue to come following the speaker's presentations. Um, and we'll have ample opportunity for audience questions as well, and there's a few different ways that you can uh, participate in the Q&A. So uh, for folks in the room, we have uh, half sheets that we'll pass out. You're able to write your questions, and we'll collect those and share them with James. Um, we'll also have the mic. Zara will be uh, running the mic for folks who want to ask questions live in the room. And for those that are on the live stream, we will be taking uh, questions through the Q&A function and sharing those out to um, our speakers as well. Uh, we have several students uh, in the room and I think also on the live stream, so we will be prioritizing student questions during the uh, Q&A sessions. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague, James Rodriguez. Uh, James is an assistant professor of urban studies at SLU and has deep roots with CUNY. He is an alum of Brooklyn College. And before joining the faculty at SLU, he was an assistant professor of history at CUNY's Gutman Community College. James has also taught at New York University and lectured in NYU's prison education program and Prescott College's social justice and community organizing master's program. He has worked as a public housing and land use organizer on the Lower East Side and has been active in tenant organizing movements in New York for over a decade. Thank you for being here with us, James. Thanks, everyone. Welcome. Thanks so much for that introduction, Sarah. I also want to extend my appreciation and my gratitude for all of our colleagues that work to put on tonight's event. Um, I'm really excited to be part of tonight's program, Legacies of Organizing at CUNY, The Power of Collective Action. CUNY is such a critical institution in New York City. And as a professor and alum, it's one that's very near and dear to me. But beyond that, student organizing has historically and still today been such a vital component of broader social movements. So I'm really thrilled this event is happening and that we've been able to assemble this truly excellent panel of speakers with so much experience in collective action and in organizing. So first, I'd like to introduce Kazembe Balagun. He is the son of Ben and Millie, a native New Yorker first generation born out of the South. He grew up in the Polo Grounds housing projects and became politically conscious after the LA Rebellion in 1992. From 1996 to 2000, he was a member of SLAM, the Student Liberation Action Movement, as a student at Hunter College. 
a broad multiracial front that sought to extend the legacy of the 1969 CUNY student movements, fighting for a free democratic CUNY. More recently, he was the program and outreach coordinator for the Brecht Forum and project manager for the Rosa Luxemburg New York office. So please welcome Kazembe. I'd also like to introduce Marissa Holmes. Marissa Holmes is an educator, filmmaker, and organizer based in Brooklyn, New York. She has produced and directed two feature films, All Day, All Week, and Occupy Wall Street Story from inside the occupation at Zuccotti Park, and After the Revolution about militarization of North Africa and the refugee crisis. Her video and written work has appeared in Truth Out, Waging Nonviolence, Nawat, Al Jazeera, and PBS. Her first book, Organizing Occupy Wall Street, This Is Just Practice, is published with Palgrave Macmillan. So please welcome Marissa. <laughs> and last but not least, I'd like to introduce Connor Coco Tomas Reed. Coco is a Puerto Rican Irish gender fluid scholar organizer of radical cultural pedagogical movements in the Americas and the Caribbean, and the program director of the Shape of Cities to Come Institute. Coco's new book, New York Liberation School, Study and Movement for the People's University, chronicles the rise of black, Puerto Rican, and women's studies and movements at the City College of New York and in New York City, as well as CUNY's post-9-11 opposition to US imperialism, colonialism, and carcerality. Coco is also developing the quadrilingual anthology, Black Feminist Studies in the Americas and the Caribbean, and they are the, uh, they are the current co-managing editor of Lapis Journal and a contributing editor of Lost and Found, the CUNY Poetics Document Initiative. So please welcome Coco. So at this stage, I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists who will give us some remarks. And then as Sarah mentioned, we're gonna turn to some more interactive and dynamic ways for some participation between our panelists and our audience and we'll take it from there. So I'll turn it over to Coco. Oh, sorry, you have your mic. I should pass this. <laughs> How's everyone doing tonight? Can y'all hear me? Yeah. How's everyone doing? OK, I see you out here. Um, uh, really, really grateful to be sharing space with you all this evening. Uh, I want to add to the gratitudes uh, to Kazembe, Marissa, and James up here, uh, to Zara, Sarah, Michael, and Nadia at School of Labor and Urban Studies, and to all of y'all for choosing to converge here today, including those who are tuning in. I um, want to name, uh, just as a starting point, that this is a pivotal emergency moment in solidarity with Palestine. And um, as I'm speaking, I'm gonna be sharing some images. Feel free to take photos of the images. Definitely feel free to uh, engage with them. Um, this will be not so much a chance for you to look at me, but for you to check out these images as we go. Um, since October, 1,139 Israelis have been killed. 33,482 Palestinians have been killed. The US government is actively funding an Israeli state genocide that for over six straight months has bombed people in Gaza and the West Bank, half of whom are children, targeting hospitals, schools, shelters, escape routes, food distribution sites, cultural centers, aid workers, teachers, students, while denying water, fuel, and basic resources to live. And this is unimaginably horrific. This is something that we need to name um, in order to be able to call for a genocide to end. Um, and here in New York, we're in the epicenter of power that could uh, work together to try to do this. So wanting to name uh, this moment that we're uh, converging in. I want for y'all to uh, come in with me in focusing tonight to look around to see who is in the room gathered here. Feel free to take a look, maybe hold each other's gaze for a moment. So this is our coalition for the night. I ask that we treat it with focus and care. When people come together to make concrete changes from our respective backgrounds, this is the soil from which new selves, new relationships, new institutions, new societies can bloom. My name is Connor, I also go by Coco. I've lived in New York for over half of my life, including 17, count them 17 years, as a student, teacher, and organizer in the City University of New York. And there's actually a glaring typo that's on the cover of this book <laughs> which is that there's only one person's name. 
Uh, this book is the result of uh, thousands and thousands of writers, hundreds of public uh, events and political actions, dozens of publications. In New York Liberation School, we chronicle how black Puerto Rican and feminist educators and students at City College and CUNY revolutionized higher education and US social movements. So we CUNY folk rooted ourselves in a formal learning institution with the aim of building enduring counter institutions. And we foreground these momentous struggles inside the City College of New York in Harlem, CUNY in New York City, and in relationship, the University of Puerto Rico and its archipelago as battles for control over social infrastructure. So focusing on how people construct radically new relations within our existing structures, right? So within the same classrooms, buildings, and cities that were often built without these changes in mind. And this recovers a really beautiful coalitional story of the people who are listed here and who are on the cover who all taught or studied at City College of New York in the 1960s and 70s. We also narrate from within CUNY struggles, our post-September 11th responses to US empire, policing, colonialism, COVID-19, attacks on reproductive rights, and more and more. At the heart of this book is a celebration that our black Puerto Rican third world feminist, queer, disabled, revolutionary cultures have radiated outwards for the last 50 plus years since the 1969 Harlem University strike. Its participants' writings have served as mobile liberation zones, portable classrooms that people have passed from hand to hand, from generation to generation. And this constitutes one of our largest pedagogical and social movement legacies, but it's all too undersung. So on this basis, I want to invite that all of you are also a part of our New York Liberation School. The book covers a broad scope of 20th and 21st century CUNY and New York City movements, but we dive into an extraordinary intervention in the 1960s and 70s of the City College SEEK, or Search for Education, Elevation, and Knowledge program. So SEEK was this multi-ethnic feminist catalyst that was working with newly admitted black and Puerto Rican students to transform what was a majority white school, City College, in the center of Harlem. So thinking about black and Puerto Rican people, these were two overlapping ethnic communities that were a coalitional force often referred to in the same breath. Our early to mid 20th century overlapping migrations to New York meant that our schools, homes, our neighborhoods suffered similar mistreatment. And because of our close proximity, our shared indignation, and often similar features, black Americans and Puerto Ricans, Afro-Puerto Ricans, black Caribbeans, developed an affinity for improving each other's lives. And this was occurring in a larger context of solidarity across the oppressed and our accomplices. So black and Puerto Rican, Afro-Asian, black and Jewish, Puerto Rican and Palestinian, black and Palestinian, anti-Zionist Jews, lesbian feminist abolitionists, and beyond and beyond and beyond, this was the profound legacy of Harlem University, this coalitional dynamism. So students and teachers infuse City College with this vision. I want for us to take a look at um, an early example from Tony Cade Bambara on what this looked like inside the classroom. She writes, we have already in our student body and on our staff at the college and in SEEK, people who know how to teach instruments, dance, lay out magazines, operate radio stations or restaurants, dismantle cars, take over TV stations, read newspapers for slant, handle landlords and cops, organize committees, set up conferences. The center should begin then to set up a network of communication so that one person desiring to set up a course in Caribbean cookery, let's say, could be put in touch with chefs, caterers, linguists, anthropologists, etc. And I want for y'all to hold this vision, right, and contrast it to often when we hear the words interdisciplinarity in the present. This is an entirely different vision. Bringing all of the range of the community inside the classroom is not just making links between disciplines that have already been forged long, long ago. So in 68 and 69, students, black and Puerto Rican students at City College started to make sweeping demands, desegregated missions, decolonized curriculum, welcome the surrounding Harlem neighborhood to co-govern. And on April 22nd, 1969, a black and Puerto Rican student-led campus occupation shut down official business for two and a half weeks and simultaneously created Harlem University. So I'm gonna read a little bit from the book about this direct action. A group of 30 who locked the gates at 5 a.m. became 400 by 11 a.m. As a counter institution, Harlem University hosted a walk-in clinic, nightly community meetings, 
a free breakfast program for kids, daycare, political education classes. The direct action lasted for over two weeks to highlight the five demands despite immense counterinsurgent pressure. 25 Harlem parents brought big pots of rice and beans and pork and pasteles, and the Lower East Side dispatched 100 parents to hold the gates. Shutting down the college demonstrated tactical power, but it also revealed to racist administrators, students, and teachers what exclusion had long felt like for black and Puerto Rican people. Closure signaled a different paradigm than integration. Harlem University understood the need to exclude those who opposed its flourishing so that new forms of freedom learning could arise. And in response to criticisms that the strike disrupted regular functioning, one black city college student said, quote, so you lose a day, a week, or a semester, we lost generations, and damn it, this is what we intend to stop, end quote. I want to give a quick shout out that there's a film that came out at the same time as this book called The Five Demands, and really encourage folks at SLU to be able to bring the directors here to screen this film. This dramatizes the Harlem University occupation, and it's just extraordinary. It's very much a teaching tool um, uh, the different places where we are. So uh, the City College strike um, it succeeded in opening up CUNY's doors, uh, admissions, implementing ethnic and gender studies, but more so announcing to the world the potential for a true people's university. But of course, there were some contradictions. So from jump, this demand for third world studies fought tooth and nail against the CUNY administration, which actually resegregated this coalitional force into black and Puerto Rican studies over here in social sciences, and Asian American and Jewish studies over here into humanities all, of course, forced to compete with each other for resources. But this was the demand that transformed the curriculum, um, very much so that opened up in the space of women's studies. So ironically, while black studies, Puerto Rican studies, Asian American studies departments at City College were battling administrators, feminist educators were able to extend these pedagogies much further across university spaces and society. And in particular, black Puerto Rican third world feminist educators um, created this uh, incredible series of resources on how society could change. Now, after the Harlem University strike, CUNY enacted this policy that we may know called Open Admissions, which allowed any graduating New York City high school student to enroll in CUNY's two and four year colleges. Now, this was a sweeping reform, um, but it was built to overwhelm the students and campus workers on the ground, an example of what we could call reform as sabotage. Now, for the housing organizers in the room, this may sound remarkably akin to how landlords may create underfunded, overcrowded, squalid living spaces. And this is a curious moment, right? Because um, as CUNY is bringing in um, people who can suddenly access a free college education, this is built on uh, low paid adjunct labor, this is built on uh, the refusal of increasing resources, and we have to definitely um, hold on to all of these aspects of the legacy of open admissions. But this was a pivotal period. Um, after uh, the Harlem University takeover, City College educators worked to boomerang the strike's perspectives outwards. And want to give an example of uh, one specific lesson that June Jordan, one of the poet teachers at City College, had given at Ocean Hill Brownsville, a neighborhood in East New York that was the site of a community control campaign. She said in a graduation speech um, to students who were entering ninth grade, quote, we must make ourselves into a community machine that will eliminate and throw out their political machinery. We must no longer wait for somebody to maybe understand our history and then to maybe teach our children the truth. We must no longer simply tremble when we hear the gunfire of police or state troopers or the National Guard. We must take control. We must protect our once only lives. We have to take apart and then replace the whole political life that has proven deadly to our own lives. We have to build a living structure of our own true human community. And for the sake of time, I want to name that um, this is really just scratching the surface of these stories. Um, I was hoping to be able to share a little bit about um, Adrian Rich, um, who was also a poet working at CUNY, um, about Audre Lorde, um, also working at CUNY, um, but want to uh, be able to fast forward to the present day. Um, so we in CUNY don't uh, necessarily uh, wax nostalgic or pessimistic about this earlier period, but we've embedded their lessons into our movements ever since. Um, our long resistance to colonialism and imperialism grew in opposition to the US wars in Afghanistan and in Iraq. 
we've recovered these teaching archives and contexts of struggle in order to teach them again in CUNY. We produced um, different kinds of uh, movement materials, infographics, um, to be able to bring issues from CUNY into the city and then back into CUNY um, to be able to think about how research and organizing that there's a continuum with uh, CUNY issues and, and uh, also what's happening around the city. Um, this is an example of some of the infographics that we had created um, over the last couple of decades. This is more recently a series of um, uh, infographics that were created uh, during 2020 when there was a real question if we're talking about abolishing defunding policing what does this look like at CUNY where there's a tens of millions of dollars of CUNY police budget that could be redirected elsewhere um, so uh, many different kinds of initiatives that have been happening um, over the last year in solidarity with Palestine, um, including, um, as you can see, a lot of these different events that um, really have tried to dramatize, not just that there is a genocide that's happening halfway across the world, but that we have a commitment and also a very specific kind of positioning to end it. And um, I'll conclude by reading a little bit from the coda of the book, which is called CUNY Will Be Free. During CUNY's upheavals, past and present, living rooms, classrooms, departments, colleges, neighborhoods, the entire city compose our field of struggle. Each classroom a potential coalition, each department a counterdisciplinary foothold, each neighborhood a vital force to defend and organize with others. If education is the practice of freedom, as Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks remind us, then where, how, and with whom we study and move is of the most profound significance. So we invite you, our New York uh, Liberation School accomplices, to be nourished by these lessons that you'll hear tonight as we strategize our futures together. And with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Kazembe. Thank you. So, check one, check two. Can y'all hear me? Wonderful, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Right on. I love it. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank everybody here, particularly at CUNY's uh, School of Labor. Um, I am a graduate of Hunter College, uh, you know, what I finally call, you know, UCLA, the University in the corner of Lexington Avenue. Um, <laughs> And um, class of 2000 in philosophy and black and Puerto Rican studies, it's so hard to come after Connor, you know what I'm saying, and that brilliance that I offer. But I mean, you know what I'm saying, I feel I'm always at home at CUNY, um, even though I've, I've never gotten an advanced degree at CUNY, I've always been welcomed back to CUNY, you know, whether the Graduate Center or here. Um, shout out to all the great teachers here. I'm always thinking about some of the people who always taught me and struggled with me Francis Fox Piven, Stanley Ivanowitz. Um, the Comrade of Slam, my brother Zach, and we're comrades together in the Student Liberation Action Movement. Um, I'm gonna pick up what kind of left off because in a lot of ways, the Student Liberation Action Movement that I was a member of from 1996 to about 2000 were the grandchildren of the uh, movement that was started in, in the City College. And it's hard to talk about the 90s because the joke goes that, you know, the 90s, so much stuff happened, but there were no pictures. So, you know, and so, and there's a lot of things in which I think it's funny because I sometimes in the 90s sometimes feel like the Bermuda Triangle or the middle child of the movement. Like everyone talks about the 60s and everyone talks about the millennials, but then somehow we get left out. You know what I'm saying? So hopefully tonight we won't get left out and say that, you know, we participated, you know, and try to carry on a traditional struggle to extend the democratic right of education to all New Yorkers. You know, in the much ways that Connor talked about, you know, we were laid with a blueprint that was given to us by our ancestors, not only in terms of like open admissions, but the right to for self determination, the right to have education to reflect our needs as a people, our identities, who we are. You know, it's so hard, you know, like it's hard it's easy today when so many movies or like have black actresses and black actors. And many of us are old remember, like, you know, we don't always have that. Even in the eighties. You know what I'm saying? You had to sit down and watch Webster. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or give me a break. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have no, no black TV shows. You know what I'm saying? If you wanted to, if there was a black TV show, you, you, know what, you know what you did? You went to the back of Jet Magazine. You know what I'm saying? You read Jet Magazine. Jet Magazine said, this, Eric LaSalle is going to be in St. Elsewhere tonight. We want all the black people to watch it 
to send a message to NBC that black people are out here. So those are all things that we had to struggle for, right? So, all, so whenever you see a black studies section in your library, a black studies section in your, your, your bookstore, understand that was one to struggle. It wasn't something that was given. And also understand that somebody at some time said, had to organize that library and give it a name, black studies. You know what I'm saying? The Schomburg had to be given a name. At some point, it, you know what I'm saying? We have a, a, you know, we're easy. You can just type in gay lesbian studies. But somebody had to, at one point, say, collect those materials and organize it. Organizing, the legacy is organizing intellectually, politically, and powerfully. Um, the way I come into this story, I'll tell you the story of what comes down. It was March 23rd, 1995. I was 19 years old. Um, at that time, uh, Rudolph Giuliani, who was mayor of New York, had threatened to blow up CUNY. He had proposed a massive budget cuts that would, that would, that would, that would, that would cripple the, the university, that would lead to a, a rise in tuition, and that would have uh, made it almost impossible for working class black and Latino and Asian students to attend the university. This was alarming to many New Yorkers throughout the five boroughs. Because for many New Yorkers, CUNY was, you know, was a, was, was, was a, was a working class gift. It was a jewel. You know what I'm saying? It was always someplace you can always go to and depend on as a social right, right, at growing up. And so I was a part of a, you know, you know and so that day, March 23rd, and I remember it, there was, call, there was a call for a demonstration at City Hall Park. And it's amazing to think about it to this day because I, was, I wasn't even at CUNY. I was out of Old Westbury, and I had heard about the demonstration. And mind you, this was not like something where like we heard about it on Twitter, because there was no Twitter. You know what I'm saying? This was hand-to-hand, -hand, people handing out flyers to each other, talking to each other. But more than that, it was a broad coalition so, so in, in, insofar as that, people are like, if, you're, if, if, if you like CUNY, come to the demonstration. You don't have to agree with every single thing on this platform, but come as you, come as you are. And people came as they, they did. Little kids came, with, with, with elementary school kids came with signs. High school kids came by the hundreds. They blew out of school. They, they left the school. They dropped out. They dropped out. They, um, they, they ditched class that day. Thousands of students from CUNY came. By that, by that morning, by the time I got out of the subway, there were 25,000 students at City Hall Park. And it was the most exhilarating time and experience I ever had in my life. To see so many people in my life. And it was one of those Mandela effects that people always talk about, I didn't see it happen. But they claimed, they said, they said that at one point, they had raised the, 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 the black liberation flag and the Puerto Rican flag on top of City Hall. Or not top of City Hall, but one of the flagpoles of City Hall Park. It was electric. Um, it, was also, uh, it was also a march that, 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 that happened largely because there were connections between what was going on internationally and locally. And it was, it was the first time this word neoliberalism was introduced into the lexicon of protest. And as such, you know, this idea of privatization, this idea of, of, of profits over people, so as such, the, 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 the demonstrators were instructed to go on an unpermitted march to Wall Street. We want to take all the students from City Hall Park to Wall Street and, and sit in Wall Street and make a demand for a free community. The police didn't like that, needless to say. And a lot of people got arrested that day. A lot of folks um, you know, ended up uh, you know, going to jail. But it left a, a definite impression on many of us. And at that point, I was like, you know, I was a student at SUNY Westbury, and I said, like, and they, everyone after the demonstration was like, if you want to go to, the, if you want to go, you know, be a part of the revolution, you need to go, to go to Hunter College. You need to go to Hunter. You need to go to Hunter. You know, and I was like, you know what? I'm a revolutionary. I'm going to Hunter. And so the following semester, um, I enrolled at Hunter College. And by that time, the Student Liberation Action Movement which was strongly organized at Hunter and at City College, right, had captured the undergraduate student government. So for the first time, and the reason that I, part of the reason that I captured it was, two, was, was, was um, 
you remember that part I told you about, like, they were, like, um, talking about, like, I was telling you that there was no internet. Like, you know, it was, like, it was, like, a lot of flyers. So, like, you know, a lot of times when you had to do organizing in the 90s, you had to have a hookup at Kinko's. You had a friend at Kinko's. You know what I'm saying? And he had the key, and he'll hook you up with the flyers. And part of the, part of the, the takeover at Hunter was, like, if we take over the student government, we get the copy machines, right? <laughs> and we get to make it the, as many copies as we want. So that's part of the reason. But by the time I came in 1996, student government at Hunter College was taken over by a group, the Student Liberation Action Movement, and we were a coalition of radicals. Um, some of us um, liberals, some of us communists, some of us socialists, a lot of us anarchists, um, who were really kind of, who were really um, dedicated to the idea of a free and open, accessible community. And, and also the same phenomenon also happened at City College as well. And I think that one of the things that I would draw from, from that for an example is, is, is two examples. One during our, our organizing at that moment was that we drew from this idea of organizing counter institutions, you know what I'm saying, within campus. So one of the issues that we had in the 1990s is that kind of mentioned that, that you know, the, the issue around open admissions, open admissions had kind of morphed into remediation mm -hmm. at, this, at the senior level, right? And that was also under threat under Giuliani. And so they said, well, get rid of remediation, which means that, same example, if you were like me, really smart in liberal studies, but bad at math, you come in, you get conditional acceptance into the university, but you have to take a, a year of math to correct that, right? They wanted to get rid of that program and put it on the junior colleges. We have protested against that. We have protested against that on, on a policy level by protesting the, the Board of Trustees, but we also protested on, on a counter-institutional level by creating programs that will allow st uh, high school students to come to, to, come to Hunter in the City College to, to, to take those classes with us alongside political education. Mm -hmm. So for example, at City College, there was the Asada Shakur Morales Center, you know, which was at the foot of City College. And that was a little community center, thank you, sister. That was a little community center that, 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 that if you were, when you went in there, um, you can get radical, you know, you can get political education. At that time, you can get your textbooks either for exchange for free or, or, or a cheaper price because we're trying to put the bookstore out of business because they were seeing the bookstores aberration as business people, you know. And three, we were trying to teach the high school students, you know, say how to prepare for CUNY, right? Same thing at Hunter. Um, uh, you know, and at Hunter, we even extended it even towards political prisoners, right? And the understanding of the question around the prison industrial complex. So I have a button that says Free Mumia Abu Jamal. Um, he was a very important figure in our movement. I'm sorry, that button fell down. He was a very important figure in our movement. Um, and we did, we did counter concerts. We had one concert called Saving Little Ones in Mumia, right? Which was a fundraiser for the Hunter College daycare center and for Mumia Abu Jamal. And then that concert featured, featured most deaf, Talib Kweli, Dead Prez, Suhair Ahmad, a bunch of folks who came through. Um, the Roots came through, and we all filled the, the Hunter College Assembly Hall. Uh, you know what I'm saying? We raised like $25,000, $35,000, or what have you, for the college, both for, the, 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 for Mamiya and, the, and, the, um, and the, um, the, the Children's Center, Hunter. And I think that the reason I think that I, I bring that to the, the, that reminder is, is going back to my, my earlier example, is that this question around CUNY is always generational. And I think that how CUNY shows up and how we organize CUNY is always gonna be dependent upon um, this question around how do we bring justice? Okay, how do, uh, how do we, how, CUNY is gonna be generational. One is, like, one is like, how do we make sure CUNY is open for our little brothers and sisters, you know, uh, who are able to have a space for education. Two, them having access to CUNY assures their citizenship and their ability to stay in New York City. You know what I'm saying? So like, much like places like Co-op City and housing or Mitchell Lamas, you know what I'm saying? 
CUNY is a very important resource to make sure that people stay in the city and not get gentrified out of the city. Number three is also, it's, it's always this question around expendable labor within black and, but within the question around black liberation and, and, and like in and, and, and black and brown bodies, right? So in the 1960s, so many brothers and sisters were drafted in the Vietnam War, but the, one of the ways you can get a draft, an oversight of the draft, is if you were in college, right? So therefore, CUNY became reported in terms of an anti-draft movement. For us, in the 1990s, so many brothers and sisters were going to jail. So for us, you know, saying CUNY was a stop point to say, we're gonna break up the prison pipeline through education. Now, we, now what I think CUNY is facing right now is an extra point of, of spendable labor, which is this idea around artificial intelligence <laughs> and, and automation. You know what I'm saying? And then you look at some, the, the, some theorists like Grace Lee Boggs, James Boggs, those type of folks, education and the people's university are super important in terms of, in terms of maintaining our sense of, of, of the dignity of labor, but knowledge production. And the last thing I'll say is this. I want us to have the opportunity to also imagine what CUNY can do. Because a lot of times we're always fighting for the restoration of cuts, that, but I, wanna, I want us to think about the expansion of CUNY. I want us to think about what does it mean to have a CUNY that during the, the height of the pandemic, the doors of City College are open and people are getting, getting lectures around the nature of viruses. And how does that destroy misinformation? What does it mean that in, in the middle of a, of, a, of, a, of, of, of a virus that the doors of Brookdale are open and people are getting mass tested and getting, getting shots and whatever they need? What does it mean to have hundreds of these type of forums every night in New York City, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? accessible to everybody all throughout, right? This, 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 this CUNY, there's a CUNY campus almost in almost every single neighborhood in this city. And so CUNY has this opportunity, I was reading New York Times the other day, and I'll end with this, that people in America feel broken, and part of the lack of the political participation in their brokenness is that the fact that they don't feel that there's a sense of totality or togetherness. And so my question is, how do we, how do we imagine a CUNY that has a, that has a potential of bringing folks together? and reasserting our citizenship, and reasserting our sense of being. And I feel like that's something in which, you know, part of the fight for liberation is a fight to assert ourselves back as citizens and back as full human beings. And, I'm, and, I, and, I, and it was a true honor to be a part of this legacy of organizing. And, um, and, um, and you guys also part of this legacy of organizing. And um, that's all I have to say for right now. So thank you so much. Oh yeah, and also um, shout out to Mar I'm a, I can't, Marissa. Shout out to you. <laughs> hello, hello. Mic check, mic check. Mic check. Um, this is a cue for you. <laughs> mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. <laughs> All right, you got it. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about organizing Occupy Wall Street. And uh, it was organized. I know not everyone knows this. Um, seems to be a mystery, but uh, you know we did a lot of work, uh, so must must have been organized. Um, and there is a a context for those who who don't know uh, of the 2008 economic crisis, um, with millions of foreclosures, rising unemployment and underemployment, especially for BIPOC folks, especially for young people. Um, and in this context, people started organizing occupations. They started taking over universities, um, even in New York City, um, and workplaces um, such as uh, Republic Windows and Doors in Chicago um, that actually was able to, to win control over the factory and set up a co-op. And um, so that was you know, a very, very moment as well. Um, neighborhoods, you know, people were 
taking <laughs> taking back the land. There was uh, a movement that started in 2007 um, in Miami um, to take back the land, to move houses folks into um, empty housing, um, which there's a lot of actually, especially in urban centers like New York. Um, so occupying things, taking things back that we built um, <laughs> was very common uh, in this, you know, crisis moment of 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, and then in December of 2010, um, there was uh, this start of the, the Arab Spring um, in Tunisia and Sidi Bouzid, um, and it grew and there were riots um, and, you know, people burned down police precincts and liberated people from prisons and took over public space. And there was an occupation at the Kasba, um, or actually multiple occupations, <laughs> um, in January of, and then February of 2011. Um, and this sort of set the, the bar for uh, a wave of struggle that, that was about to happen. So um, folks in, in Egypt who were watching this thought, wow, we, you know, they just overthrew a dictator, like, <laughs> we need to do that too. Um, so they went out and, you know, they, they targeted their own, you know, dictator Mubarak and um, a national police day. Um, so, you know, all these connections between policing and dictatorships, I think, are important to unpack. Um, but they, they took over to Rear Square in Cairo and then... Um, Watching this unfold in, in Europe, um, there is Puerto del Sol in Madrid, actually the center of Spain. Sol is literally the center. <laughs> um, and it's spread out from there. Um, and then in Syntagma Square in Greece, in Athens. Um, and so people, you know, all over the world, all, well, all over North Africa and the Middle East and Europe were talking about real democracy or direct democracy, rising up, taking over space, um, public space, um, and building alternatives, building assemblies um, so people could participate in the decisions that affected their lives, um, building you know, mutual aid networks. Um, and in this context, <laughs> there is a call from Adbusters. So Adbusters was this, uh, and still is, a cultural and political magazine based in Canada. Um, and they put together this, this poster with the Wall Street Bull um, and a tactical briefing. A lot of people in New York did not take this seriously. Um, they were like, oh, you're a bunch of artists. You know, you're not really gonna do anything on the ground. Uh, we're, we're doing the serious organizing work. Um, and so a lot of people did not uh, wanna show up uh, to our early planning assemblies, but the 30 or so of us who did, um, uh, were very successful. <laughs> so we, uh, we had this assembly um, in Tompkins Square Park in the Lower East Side, um, and we met every week throughout uh, August of 2011, and we developed these directly democratic processes. We had working groups for tactical, for medical, for media facilitation. I was in the media group and the facilitation group. Um, we scouted throughout the financial district, and um, we used consensus, um, which you know basically is just uh, cooperating, collaborating, rather than <laughs> coercing other people to do things, right? So the exact mechanisms can change depending on the context and the people involved, but um, you know we were sort of using a mix of what was happening in 2011 in the squares um, and um, histories of of practices passed down through the American left. Um, and we used these hand signals, which sort of became emblematic of the movement, um, although we did not invent them. And uh, they're just useful for like large groups of people to communicate, <laughs> um, something to think about. You know, visuals can, can be useful. And we also came up with this, um, we are the 99% slogan. Um, you know, it's often attributed to David Graeber, um, you know, rest in, in power. Uh, dear friend and comrade, and uh, uh, he tried to tell everyone it was not his idea. Um, <laughs> it was actually a product of collective intelligence. Um, 
most people didn't didn't really pay attention to that uh, that nuance, but it really was. It was really something that we talked about in the assemblies and in the committees, and definitely in the outreach working group. Um, they made the first flyer, the 99% flyer, um, and then a friend of mine made this Tumblr page um, for the for people to to identify themselves, you know, with with the 99%. Um, and the stories were incredible, right? I mean, people were losing their homes, they had been laid off, they were, you know, <laughs> dealing with really um, difficult uh, life situations, stress. Um, there were even children holding up, you know, signs about the future that they were going to inherit. I mean, yeah, some people um, had, had uh, really terrible mental health issues. Um, but it was just this flood of, of people who, you know, had been had been left out and really like uh, seriously exploited and oppressed, you know, by the by the system, you know. And then in 2008, especially, this accelerated. Um, so okay, so the occupation itself um, was a direct action. Um, so we didn't get a permit. We didn't ask permission. We just took it uh, and defended it every day, all day, all week. Um, and <laughs> it was a lot of work um, to, to maintain, um, but beautiful, you know, and people brought like so much energy, brought their hearts, um, and we built this kind of city within a city, you know, um, an alternative vision of the world um, in the here and now. And uh, it, was, it was autonomous, you know, that was the, the idea that we would, you know, build this parallel space with parallel institutions, counter institutions, let's say. Um, for food, for housing, for meeting people's needs, um, and engaging in mutual aid. Um, and I'm not going to play this video, but I'll just give you a, a sense of um, you know people who came. I mean, there are thousands of people who came through that park, who built it, and uh, really the you know the structure that we had that was horizontal, that was emergent, that you know allowed people to step in. Um, was really important for, for that to happen. I think if it had been too overly determined, too controlled from the beginning, um, people would not have, have been able to, to step in in the way that they did. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, there, there was a woman who came um, just to, to knit sweaters for us. There was uh, someone who was a vet who wanted to take care of the stray dogs who came. <laughs> um, there was... Uh, actually, a, a Lakota elder who came, who um, who I thought would be really cold. <laughs> um, I tried to offer him like you know extra blankets and stuff, and he was like, "No, I you know I, I got it." You know, um, so there's just a a lot of experience um, that people had um, that you wouldn't e even know in, unless you held that space um, for people to share it. And uh, yeah, so people came. And uh, oop, yeah, and uh, yeah, and then we had over a hundred working groups um, within three weeks. Um, <laughs> so we went from thirty people meeting in a park to you know over a hundred people and like four thousand organizers. Not even just people showing up to things, but people actively organizing the space um, and various projects around it. Um, so we needed to scale. So we started. Um, this spokes council process with working groups coordinating with one another um, on logistics of the park. Um, and also um, the assembly, as beautiful as it was at times, didn't have any structural mechanism to deal with equity. Um, <laughs> so there are these caucuses that formed. There is a People of Color caucus, there is a Women's caucus, Queering OWS caucus, Disability caucus, you know, everything that you can all, all the oppressions that people have, you know, like there were caucuses for those. Um, and got it. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'll, I'll try to try to be quick. Um, and anyway, so we, we created um, uh, the Spokes Council also with that in mind to try to address um, the structural you know, inequities that, that existed in the assembly. Um, and yeah, uh, so it's one way to, to scale up. And then also, um, after the park, after the eviction, you know, this this work continued, and um, and there was just this incredible amount of contagion. So over a thousand occupations happened um, all over the world, you know, all over the U.S. and then also, you know, in other places. There was Occupy Antarctica. Um, it was there was that that big, um, 
And so there needed to be networking between those occupations. And a lot of that happened through media, through live stream initially, um, and real-time communication. And um, there was also this proliferation of the practices that we were using, these you know, more democratic horizontal practices um, into different sectors of society. So like going beyond the example of, of the city within a city and looking at the whole whole city, right? Um, and so there were work, the rank and file workplace organizers who built for the, the general strike in, in 2012. Um, there were people organizing at CUNY, um, obviously, and the, the Free University, um, so many projects, you know, 14 different neighborhood assemblies, um, working on housing issues at the height of the housing crisis, um, or the foreclosure crisis at the time. Um, so it, it really expanded out um, and, and was coalitional, um, which is something that, you know, you've heard a lot of, <laughs> um, but there's just no way that we would be able to do the, the scale of what we did or have the impact that we did without having strong coalitions with folks um, and influencing these, these different sectors of society. Um, okay, so like some of the offshoots, there is uh, Occupy Sandy, which was a people-powered recovery effort um, to a hurricane that happened in 2012. Um, you know, it was uh, operating on a scale that, that was uh, on the level of FEMA, doing sometimes more than FEMA. <laughs> FEMA would come and just drop off water um, because they didn't know where to go. Um, there was this real kind of challenge to the, um, the way that the state responds typically to, to crises like that. Um, and there was also strike debt, um, trying to connect different kinds of debt, um, which I think is important to highlight, you know, now there's a lot of, there's organizing around student debt specifically, um, not saying that that's not a good, like people should organize <laughs> around that, but, but what we had in mind was really a connection between medical debt, housing debt, student debt, you know, the debt system, the, as, you know, a sort of foundation of capitalism. <laughs> um, and by refusing those debts, um, calling into question the whole, the whole relationship and like what kind of value is created. Um, so that's what we were doing. We were having assemblies around debt, having people share their stories. Um, again, really important to have that kind of catharsis and know that like you're not alone, <laughs> um, that people are going through similar struggles and uh, yeah, just supporting one another. Um, okay, I talked about internal challenges. Okay, external challenges. Um, so yeah, so we were, we were facing co-optation um, from the Democratic Party, primarily um, the Working Families Party in New York, and then the Bernie Sanders campaign <laughs> on a national level, um, using a lot of our rhetoric, but then um, not following through on any of the, <laughs> the promises made. Just as an example, you know, de Blasio, um, Blasio, uh, promised to, to do all this reform on policing, right? And then <laughs> And, and stop and frisk, um, and then created this whole new broken windows, you know, paradigm, um, and uh, and brought in the architect of stop and frisk, um, increased police funding, created a counterterrorism unit to target us um, and Black Lives Matter and all the other movements that came after. Um, so, yeah, the co-optation and repression went hand in hand. It was often even the same people and power. Um, and in the aftermath of that, um, you know, we saw this rise of neo-fascism also kind of co-opting some of our rhetoric. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're facing now um, basically these, these two challenges of, um, of the return of the status quo and, and co-optation on that end and then, and then neo-fascism on the other. Um, and I think that uh, you know it's helpful to, to sort of break down like like what we could do better um, going forward and and I think because I want to win I want us all to <laughs> to build better movements in the future and I see all of these as just experiments uh, like on the road toward you know liberation um, and I think if we had done these things we would have been stronger I don't know if we if Occupy itself would still be around but um, we definitely would have been stronger so. Yes, setting clear intentions, working at the intersections um, from the beginning, right? Um, not as an afterthought. Um, being accountable to one another. So we didn't. We also didn't have those structures at the beginning. We had to build them after the fact. Um, 
and yeah, distributing resources. Um, there were definitely concentrations of resources, despite it being Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> um, money was still a big problem, and um, yeah, and we need to take care of ourselves and you know become resilient um, so that we can keep fighting you know in the long term. Um, so th those are my lessons. Hopefully they're helpful. Uh, I don't know, but I'm looking forward to talking with everyone. And uh, yeah, I'll wrap. I guess it is. All right. Thanks so much for our panelists. I think there is so much from each each of their remarks. So at this stage, we're gonna do like a pair share or a turn and talk if you will it's like a tomato tomato situation i suppose so we're going to take about five minutes so folks can turn to someone in your vicinity think about or discuss or raise any questions that you might have had through any of our individual remarks that we heard or some of the connections between them thinking through some of the legacies and history of organizing as well as the contemporary challenges and struggles that folks are facing around organizing and student organizing now. And then we're gonna turn back, share some of those from a few different groups, and then open it up for some wider questions between our panelists and discussion as well as other folks in the audience. So yeah, maybe turn to someone in your vicinity and take about five minutes and get to know each other and do some discussing. Piggybacking off all the great panelists here, uh, talking about uh, the student movement in CUNY in 72, in, in the CUNY movement uh, I was part of in the 90s, um, going back to even some of these protests against the Gulf War, maybe that was the forerunner. I hadn't even thought to make that connection. And, and just hearing about Occupy Wall Street in terms of uh, how a small number of organizers can have these dynamic, dynamic impact and even when there's moments that seem that there's sort of a lull that to, to circle back to the energy that if we can even a, a you know a small relatively small group of people can have a huge impact and it's just bring, bringing it all back to me here and, and and that's what I drew from our little little conversation over here other folks I see on the left side of the room my left side anyway Hello? You can hear me all right? Yeah. Cool, great. <laughs> um, I'm very curious uh, to sort of learn more about um, the student, uh, the CUNY student movement's history with organized labor um, uh, and trade unions. Uh, I actually am doing research on coalition building between uh, groups like student student unions and um, trade unions. I recently did an interview with Ethan Millich, who uh, is a coordinator at, at uh, CUNY Rising Alliance, and he gave me some really great insight as to what they're doing with PSC CUNY and all that. So I just love to like hear from one of the panelists more on that specific topic. Other folks want to share back and then we can kick it over to the panelists to respond and then we can also draw some more questions and commentary from the audience as well. So um, it's interesting you, would, you, you, you brought that up because when I was involved in uh, CUNY, actually I was one of the organizers for the rally at City Hall and uh, I was manning the stage where we wouldn't allow uh, politicians on. It was really a great event. And I remember the police stopped us from marching. It was pretty intense. But in other areas, what I remember is labor, organized labor was always very slow to get involved. And they needed a particular reason to get involved. And I remember once we had a breakfast with 1199 Dennis Rivera. And he bought his breakfast and he basically walked away. Now, of course, the students were much more radicalized than organized labor, and organized labor had its interests that moved much slower. And unfortunately, I never thought the two met when as much as they should have. And um, I think that's just one, 
we're looking at things from different points of view, organized labor and students. Students tended, I know when I was younger, I think the slogan for that rally was shut it down, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And um, I don't think that was labor's call at that time. You know, they just, <laughs> they weren't going to agree with that. But I do think there are always opportunities. That's for sure. Because I also remember when the World Trade Center, the 32BJ workers were on strike, and we had a Student for Labor coalition, and some of the rank and file came to an event that we had. So I, I think you just got to figure out where to find those openings. Also, Larry Hanley on Staten Island, when the school bus teachers went on strike, we had taken over the newspaper on Staten Island. We I thought, that, yeah. yes, College Voice that, with yeah. the hammer and sickle on the masthead. Yes, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it really was. It was a lot of, it was, it was, it was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were able to work with some progressive labor leaders like Larry Hanley. Larry Hanley was really a very progressive guy. So he came to support us and then we came to support him. So there were openings, but sometimes labor, organized labor just moves at a different pace, as I'm sure a lot of people in this room realize. I'm just going to sh share a couple uh, comments that have come in from our live stream um, connected uh, this way. So um, one comment, um, in, you know, to put this in the room, if we could share more about current organizing happening at CUNY today. So I'd say sort of frame that both to our speakers, but if there's folk folks in the room who are currently engaged in campaigns, you know, please, please share out. Um, we want to make this uh, collective both from our speakers and from our audience. Um, and also, you know, I think to echo uh, you know, just hearing uh, Jimmy talking then too, uh, you know, uh, there's a comment that I feel we should have more forums in the historical studies that students have made in the past um, for us uh, to have opportunities to learn from their solidarity and organizing. So I uh, just want to put that out uh, in the space as well from our live stream uh, audience. Um, one thing that I'm curious about is um, where PSC was during these movements, um, because it seems like recently their PSC seems to be at the front of like New Deal for CUNY and a lot of campus organizing. And so I'm wondering if they just, like if there was a shift at some point, when that shift happened, why that shift happened, um, yeah. How about we have one more and then we can get some panelist responses and then kick it back to the audience. I think what is a common theme in the conversation and the anecdotes they share, it's like this organizing from below that um, it is very, really impressive and cool. Not only in you know or organizing an occupation uh, which led to um, diversity at CUNY, uh, but also um, you, you know Marissa, you know, sharing anecdotes about being one of the first person in those meetings, showing that you know we play a role in making a difference, not only within the university, but also in, br in building broader uh, social movements. Um, and that CUNY you know, you, um, has a, students play a major role in creating e independent political organizations or working class institutions that really have a vast power uh, from below to, to um, shift narratives and, and fight for what we, all deserve, so thank you for sharing. I just wanted to share that anecdote. Yeah, great sentiment. So I'm gonna kick it to the panelists. Do folks wanna respond to some of the questions and comments that we heard in the room? I think that, um, check one, check two. Um, I think that um, as, at SLAM, at Hunter, um, we had very good relationships with insurgent trade unionists, including the New Caucus. And the New Caucus was actually founded around the same time the SLAM was founded. And so I remember those meetings with Stanley Aronowitz and, you know, and SLAM talking about the potential of labor and students getting together. I also remember, like, you know, I was a news editor at the Hunter Envoy which is a student newspaper. Now, 
the Hunter Envoy came out, and the leadership of the Envoy came out of another newspaper called the Spheric, that was an independent newspaper. And part of the reason that I had, you know, I, you know, I, I had pushed for our election into the Envoy, which was the main student newspaper of Hunter, was based on a book that I had read by Dan George Jackis called Detroit, I Do My Dying. And in that book, students had taken over the student newspaper and turned it into a vehicle for labor, organ, labor community organizing. So the Wayne State newspaper became the newspaper voice of the Dodge Revolutionary Union movement, which was a mostly black insurgent um, trade union. And so when I was news editor and Jet Brandt you know, was the editor at that time as well, we had decided to turn it into a community-based newspaper, similar to what you talked about in Staten Island, that will also cover issues around not only what's going on in the campus, but issues around police brutality. We'll cover issues around labor organizing and things of that nature. And through that, we also were also part of like wanting to build insurgent caucuses within, you know, particular unions around the city, you know, which we were very friendly with. And so I think that it was all a part of the vibe that we wanted to do because I think that since the 1960s, there was this traditional separation between what I call the labor movement and the social movements, right? And the social movements came out of the labor movement were very much established trade unions that oftentimes that excluded um, marginalized communities. So the tendency was not, you know, not to have lots of blacks, Puerto Ricans at the forefront of some of these trade unions. And so they had to form, so, so out of that pressure, you had to form a social movement that came from the outside to, to kind of, and sometimes there was tension between the social movements and the labor movements, right? And what we tried to do at CUNY was trying to look at the whole, right? And look at the whole student, not just as a student, but also as a worker, as an artist, as a thinker, as an activist in all these other places, to have a united front, if you, if you will, of these different movements. And so, to the extent that we had an opportunity to do so, we wanted to challenge and create spaces for democratic change throughout. Um, and it was funny, too, because the, the, workers, the, workers, the workers loved us, you know, saying, um, we would do funny things that would, like, that would, that would make the, the office workers laugh at Hunter. For example, right, at, 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 at the Envoy, you know, we would take a basic um, uh, memos that the president will send us, and we call them bullshit reports. And we would put, a, we would put it on the front page of the Envoy, and then we would just do a kind of corrective, you know what I'm saying, of, like the, of the language of it. And it cracked everybody up in the office because the office workers have to had to produce this and like send it out, so we would take it, we print it, and we say, you know, you know what it really meant underneath, you know, as a counter, and everyone kind of loved it to such a point where like they stopped sending us memos, <laughs> they wouldn't send us memos anymore, you know. But you know, but but you know, but you know, we got to know this because you know secretaries and, and workers within CUNY were like, yo, you have no idea, you cracked us up, this was funny. You know, saying so you really brought a humanity to that to situation and things of that nature. So there was always that type of level of a communication and like not trying to be non antagonistic in a lot of ways. Right on. Um, if I can just add a little bit to that, um, are y'all still with us up here? I see y'all. Um, so uh, I lived here when I was very young, um, but moved back here in 2005. And I'm just curious, a shout out from the audience, was there any kind of significant strike that happened in 2005 here in New York City? Oh, say it louder. The transit workers strike, right? You have it where working people's labor literally reproduces this city on a daily basis. The city does not run without all of our labor, right? And it was this incredible example of what happens when people are organized in specific sectors but the solidarity of people around the city saying, oh, it's tougher for me to get to work for these couple of weeks, but I actually really support this strike because this is something that also speaks to how I could potentially get better working conditions where I am, right? 
And I think uh, a couple of folks asking um, these questions about the relationship between student movements and labor struggles, um, and even speaking about some of these hard earned lessons from CUNY, you know, it's um, a bit of a complicated story because here in New York, um, the Professional Staff Congress um, through CUNY's movement history has often not been on the same side of these larger militant struggles that Kazembe had mentioned. Um, in 1976, when tuition is imposed across the board at CUNY, um, there was an attempt by rank and file members to develop a strike to be able to say, we don't want tuition to be imposed, we want this to remain a free university, and uh, the PSC actually made sure that that didn't happen. Several thousand people lost their jobs in CUNY, many of the militants who had created open admissions. Fast forward to 2016, um, there was uh, a call for developing the capacity for strike readiness. Um, this was, uh, there was a vote in our union, the Professional Staff Congress, 97, no, 92% of people who had voted said, yes, we encourage the union to be able to take action for striking if necessary. Um, the union didn't take that strike. Um, fast forward to 2020, um, during the early part of the pandemic, as people were literally trying to survive, right, um, we saw that after the spring of 2020, that CUNY was going to um, lay off uh, three, 4,000 uh, people's uh, jobs. And once again, our union kind of didn't take the moment of being able to say, this is a time when we really need to stand up for the possibilities of what this university is, to be able to make sure that we're fighting for people who are here as students, as workers. Um, I do want to give a shout out that there are people who are in this room um, who are bringing into CUNY labor struggles from NYU, from Columbia. We are in a larger movement ecosystem, so anytime that we're having labor and student struggles in CUNY, we need to also be connecting with struggles that are happening at other universities. Um, in terms of speaking about the present, um, definitely encourage y'all to follow and support the work that um, a network of people called CUNY on Strike is doing right now, thinking really carefully about what it would mean to develop the capacity to strike, thinking about um, these different models of community assemblies, um, how not just in our various uh, schools, but also in our neighborhoods, what it would mean to bring people along with us as we're thinking about reclaiming CUNY. Um, also want to give a shout out that there's been uh, an, an array of different kinds of uh, campaigns, organizations that have come and go. Um, thinking about the work of SLAM, the work of Free CUNY, uh, 7K or Strike, um, and a continually existing group, Rank and File Action. All of these have really pushed the needle to the left um, in terms of thinking about what's possible here. And you know, maybe just one more piece that I'll share is when we may be fearful of what it would mean to take collective action in the scope of a kind of strike. I want for us to consider that this might actually be more fundamentally a fear about what our collective power is in jumping into a state of uncertainty. So there's often the uncertainty that's imposed upon us by the state, by these corrupt politicians, right? But there's also a state of uncertainty where we're leaping into something that could be an entirely different way how to have social relations, an entirely different way how to navigate um, being in this university together, right? But it's a kind of um, following and navigating that uncertainty on our own terms. And so I want to invite, you know, we still have plenty of time for discussion, but really want to invite folks to consider this to be a reflection space and also a strategizing space. Um, you know, really the, the best chapters of our CUNY movement are still yet to be written. So really uh, down to be reflecting with y'all tonight. That will be a sequel, you know, the next, next book. Um, I, uh, I realized I didn't say at the beginning that I am also a CUNY alum. <laughs> There's something about this place. Um, I went to Hunter, so, you know, it's where all the, the revolutionaries come from, I guess. Um, <laughs> Brooklyn College, so many, yeah, so many places, not just, not just Hunter, but... Um, 
but yeah, but I, I went to CUNY and I also worked at CUNY and I was also fired from CUNY for organizing on the job. Um, and Coco here helped me, um, you know, in that, that rehire campaign. So very grateful for, for the solidarity. Um, and now, now I'm back. They keep inviting me back. I don't know what that's about. Um, I think I'm, I'm actually trespassing right now. That's the, the last sort of official notice that I got from the university. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's, a lot, um, there's a lot that can be done here and has been done here and um, by students. And you know, I was a student here when I organized Occupy. Um, I, I really don't know how I did both. Um, I got <laughs> somehow it worked out, but yeah, it was uh, it was definitely an exciting time to you know to be among young young people and students and organizing and um, and that's where all the energy and excitement you know co always comes from. Um, and then the labor leaders who sit back, you know, they're all they they don't know what to do, right? Um, we had these meetings at the labor council that were really funny because. Um, they, they tried to, to encourage us to send representatives. They were like, well, you know, we can't possibly coordinate anything without representation, right? So like we all have our people from, you know, from different unions. You know, so we, you need to send Occupy reps. Um, and we refused because that, that was just contrary to the whole spirit of the thing. So uh, we all went. So then we had like 100 people packed into this meeting um, with SEIU and um, they, uh, yeah, they were they they were not happy, uh, <laughs> but they kind of accommodated us for a while. Um, you know, at least on the surface, they were like, "Well, I guess you're kind of like delegates or spokes. Like, you can have like an assembly over here, and then we'll have our meeting over here, and we'll just relay information back and forth." Um, and so the the two kind of structures did speak to each other. Um, it was possible. Um, that wasn't actually the barrier. The, the barrier was uh, just their total lack of interest in mobilizing the base, <laughs> um, which is kind of the only reason to have, you know, a large union like that and have paid staff and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, is to actually turn people out and, you know, like encourage them to, um, to participate, but um, they, didn't, they didn't do that. They actively dissuaded people. And, um, yeah, so... There is this tension. There's a tension <laughs> between the, the movement and the you know the trade unions, and um, I uh, I don't know. Maybe that's just inevitable. That will just keep happening. Um, but we were able to kind of push them um, by offering alternatives and and also by showing up for for workers. You know, like going to picket lines, going to actions that rank and file folks called, um, and. The, the May Day planning meetings in 2012 were, were pretty porous places, you know, like um, people could come uh, who were maybe part of a union but had disagreements, you know, with, with the leadership um, and they could coordinate across sectors um, with other rank and file and I think that, that was really, you know, powerful too. Um, and it affected how people organized, you know, like uh, CWA, for instance, like started doing assemblies um, of workers and, you know, so, so we had this effect. We had this, it was like like this contagion, right? <laughs> like this, this very, um, um, I don't know, now with the pandemic, it seems like maybe I shouldn't use that word, but, but it definitely, uh, you know, it spread out um, in, you know, into these practices that people adopted. Um, the, the good, yeah, the good kind of super spreader event. Um, and yeah, what else did I want to say? Um, oh, about yeah, about the role of um, like media and journalism because you mentioned this Detroit I Do My Dying book, and I actually read that like before Occupy. I totally forgot that that was <laughs> because I spent some time in Detroit and um, was really inspired by by that book and also by the Bog Center and the organizing that they were doing, and. Um, yeah, I I do th I do think that that's one way that a small group of people can <laughs> can change the world or you know have an impact is is by having having a press or ha you know having some way of of getting information out disseminating things and um, part of the reaction to to occupy um, was to to clamp down on that right like we lost a lot of the social media accounts we lost a lot of our ability to amplify information and. Um, 
you know, and that, and, and especially in, in 2018, um, after Cambridge Analytica broke, there was, a, there was more regulation, but what that meant was actually this, you know, cooperation between big tech and, <laughs> um, and the security state at a whole other level, um, and a lot of accounts were banned during that time, and um, so I, I think it is, it's, it's very important now, strategically, to, to have our own platforms, to have, you know, autonomous servers, ways of, of operating because um, clearly those are go all going to be taken away um, in a moment's notice. So yeah, just the, the power of, of media, it's important. Yeah, I saw some other hands maybe, some other folks have questions or some commentary that folks may wanna offer to our panelists or to the room in general. While, while folks marinate on that question, I'll, I'll jump in and something that's been on my mind through each of these kind of remarks and some of the remarks that we just heard in, in conversation with our panelists, um, thinking about the role of institutions and higher education in general, right? And thinking about particularly in a moment where we're seeing really deep suppression of student organizing on campuses across the city, across the nation, how do we make sense of what the role of the institution, of the university is, is currently what it should be, what it could be when it relates to student organizing and broader organizing and social movements in general? So if folks have any kind of thoughts or reflections on that, I would really love to hear panelists um, try to tackle some of those. And also, of course, the audience other folks, feel free to jump in. You can have those written questions. There should be materials at your desk or going around. Um, and Zara is on our roving mic. So if other folks have thoughts or questions um, or want to share where, where they might be in their own organizing or student organizing struggles, we would also really love to hear that too. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, I want to echo a question someone had in the YouTube, I think, is uh, which was if you guys are aware of any current movements going on at CUNY and uh, like the status of them as of yet. That's it. And while other folks, again, are still marinating, I'll ask a question that also came in before our panel um, from some of our, our, register, our registrants. How do we draw from legacies situated in a specific historical context into today's organizing that constantly adapts to changing times and identities? So thinking about the lessons that we've learned or the context that folks have organized in or researched in some prior moments, given the changes in our contemporary moment. What works, maybe what doesn't, what's changed, maybe what hasn't changed. Um, so, uh, I have a question with regards to, um, Occupy Wall Street, um, and I think you mentioned, you know, the, the phenomenon of co-optation, which is a, you know, an old story when it comes to social movements and all that, but, um, I guess, like, one of the critiques that I remember about the Occupy Wall Street movement was there a shul of, like, electoral politics and party politics and partisan politics, and I think... From that experience, it seems to me that a lot of people who participated in that movement went to emphasize the importance of building institutions, like durable organization institutions, not just in terms of mobilizing, but actually you know, building institutions that can organize people in a more structured way. Now, I appreciate your presentation in terms of like, actually, no, there was a lot of organizing, there was a lot of structure, but I'm wondering about the relationship with that in electoral politics, particularly the Bernie Sanders campaign, which I think when I think one of the 
key legacies in my mind is uh, the introduction of the language of class and inequality into public discourse, which Bernie Sanders amplified even more. Um, what, yeah, what's, what's your opinion of that? Is that a form of co-optation, I guess? I guess, in a negative sense? Panelists, I don't know if you want to start tackling some of those questions in the room. I love how coy y'all are being. <laughs> the, I mean, y'all were buzzing and then just got all shy, but. I know that sometimes when we're in a formal space, there can be a little bit of hesitance to, to bring in what we're thinking, what we're feeling. And uh, one of the amazing aspects of the CUNY movement legacy is people really changing what it feels like to gather in a room together, right? Mm -hmm. The power of us choosing to all be here, right? Um, one of CUNY poet educators, Jean Jordan, talks about need the need to create living rooms, right? And um, you know, this isn't by any means like a kind of you know push or a prod, but what happens when we're able to turn our classrooms and our university spaces into places that are more like living rooms? Um, really invite us to make use of this time together. Um, maybe pausing to see if there's, if that cajoled anyone to, to share some thoughts. Um, yes, I see you. Thank you. Go ahead. Feel free to do this one now. Let's open down the room. Okay. Hey, we got two people. Yes. Hello. Um, thank you so much for this just amazing, really beautifully put together, just history into what we are and what, ke what we can be. Um, thinking about kind of the University of Harlem and all of the movements around like the Occupation City College, all of these things. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like I remember reading that high schoolers were also involved in some of this stuff. So my question is, because the whole problem of higher education and organizing in higher ed, um, I was UAW 2110 um, and then also worked at CUNY for a little bit, so the, the whole issue is uh, um, transitionality, right? We're not here for long enough to really consistently organize. Um, so how can we collaborate and like really build that fire and sow those seeds with young people who will go into these institutions, right, so that they're ready to launch? I, um, this is not the first time that's happened. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just, I, you know, I, I think there's something, well, so I'll maybe combining the questions with, you know, the ephemerality of college, that is, there's a hope that student activists will graduate and leave, and how that shapes kind of what sort of, you know, the, the you know, the lasting impacts of the activism, the types of activism that happen. The other one is just about the changing nature of New York. I mean, par part of, you know, some of the history you talk about the 19, in the 1970s, that's a, a, a very different New York than the one we're living in. And I'm just wondering how that, yeah, how that, how that shapes kind of the type of activism that's happened, how that, you know, going into the 80s and 90s, how we were talking, we were just having kind of, kind of a nostalgia uh, trip of just kind of remembering the Kinko's days or the indie media days or the, you know, where you'd get the information about where to go or where to show up. And, you know, I feel like now I, you know, it's, uh, it's on your phone, you know, and uh, that too, the technological ways, technolog technology has changed how protest happens on campus and off campus, so. Folks want to jump in and start tackling some of those questions on the panel? I can quickly respond to a few, and thank y'all for hearing that call and response of like, are y'all out there? Yes, we're here with you. Um, and you can feel, you know, there's a shift that happens in a room when that call and response happens. Um, so um, really, really powerful questions and reflections. Um, wanting to think about the role of the university, um, it is by no means predetermined. It's by no means something to glamorize. It is uh, literally a place where people gather um, in different kinds of historic material conditions. And um, what we choose to do is very much so um, 
not written. It, it's not uh, something that, that we should um, think is, is going to be a given. But I feel like we have these examples of CUNY across these different periods that we've talked about, including to the present, where there's a particular way that the school can become a convergent space where people are asked and invited and encouraged to think critically about their lives, to make connections with what's happening between the classroom and then also what's happening in their neighborhood, in their parents, in their grandparents' lives. Um, very much so a question of the university sometimes being a bellwether for political issues that are um, happening much more broadly. Um, you know, there are some uh, radical scholars who I uh, deeply respect, but who seem to be making a bit of a misstep in the present where they're saying the university is fraught, we need to flee it. We need to create a mass exodus from it. And I, I fear that what may happen is that in that vacuum, the far right neo-fascists are more than happy to fill up that vacuum, right? And these kind of hard-earned lessons of CUNY movement histories, you know, Eric Adams would be more than happy to set the terms of CUNY curriculum, like Ron DeSantis and Christopher Rufo would be happy to set the terms of Florida curriculum, right? Um, so I feel like there's a way that, you know, we really need to defend this university. And that's why I had, you know, invited for folks who were reading this to see themselves as also part of our New York Liberation School if they've read and been changed by an Audre Lorde poem or by an Adrian Rich essay and so forth. Um, I think sometimes it can be difficult when we um, are so connected to um, the lessons of history that we may kind of uncritically transplant one series of strategies or one series of tactics from one period onto another. And, um, you know, sometimes this is referred to as like a floating tactic, right? So it was like a specific series of things that came from a certain time period and we can just plop it into another and uh, really encourage us to not do that, right? But to try to practice um, um, this kind of uh, work of translation, like what may work in a different time and in a different place, but making sure that it can adhere to what's possible right now. Um, and, you know, to just uh, conclude on that, I'm really appreciating the continual question, what's happening in CUNY right now, you know? Um, want to encourage, in addition to uh, CUNY on strike, in addition to um, following and supporting the work of the Professional Staff Congress and all of the unions that are here um, nestled in CUNY, um, want to lift up again that there is a genocide in Gaza that's happening right now. CUNY for Palestine has been at the forefront, not just here in this city, but across the country and being able to say unapologetically we stand against genocide um, and really encourage folks to uh, follow, support, attend rallies that CUNY for Palestine is doing. One group that has been making incredible moves here in the city within our lifetime um, is largely comprised of people who are current and former CUNY students, right? Um, in the last couple of years, we have also uh, really consciously made sure that we would defend people who were attacked by the far right, um, people like Shaleen Rodriguez, people like Nardine Kiswani, like Fatima Mohammed, when they are you know, teaching or where they are studying at CUNY and you know, they encounter um, anti-abortionists or when they're literally giving a graduation speech and then they are targeted by the far right we need to kind of come around them and say like, no, these people will not be left out in the cold. Like we stand with them. And I feel like this is, you know, um, a, a movement phrase that often people will say, like if they come for me in the morning, they'll come for you at night. And I feel like we really need to hold on to, you know, if they come for what's happening in terms of collective power, radical imagination, and really, you know, a, a sense of social change, that we've been long practicing here at CUNY, if they come for people in CUNY, then those who are maybe differently and less positioned um, to be involved in movement um, will be even worse off. So in a way, you know, we kind of have uh, uh, our job cut out for us as also being a model for what people can do in other universities. So invite us to think really seriously about that, um, about that position. Um, wanna kick it to uh, Marissa or Kazembe? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that. Um, I want to answer a couple of questions. Um, one was like, what's the role of the university at this moment? And how do we draw legacies? And I really want to answer, and I also want to touch a base with like, you know, the whole time question around Occupy Wall Street. And I want to frame it within the context of racialized capitalism. And the very fact of the matter is, is that the wealth that we understand, you know, that's in New York City right now, 
is based largely upon New York City being the largest importer of slaves and enslaved Africans in the world next to Charleston. And that that wall of Wall Street was built to keep the Native Americans out of that sector. And that the farms around Wall Street were, were given the blacks as buffers to protect the white sector, right? So there's a whole entire geography in which racialized wealth is built around a very small group of people, that 1%, that still has mani manifestations of today. And the reason I bring that up is because I think that, you know, we have to name the roles of institutions at this particular time, you know what I'm saying, as we're protesting these institutions. So maybe not so much CUNY, but certainly the private universities in this town, you know, are tremendous land-owning, wealth-owning entities, you know what I'm saying, with billions and billions of dollars of endowments, right, that, that just sit on wealth all the time. They sit on land, they sit on property, they sit on stocks, they don't do anything, you know what I'm saying? And so I think that there might be a need insofar as wrapping these questions around who a university student is and, and us to demand land back, to, to demand reparations, you know what I'm saying? I understand that that is a reform, but it may be a non-reformist reform in terms of making demands of return to universities to really kind of cure a lot of the ills that we have. Um, and I think that's very important for us to really have an understanding of that, and that as we're you know, going into collective organizing, go into whatever organizing you're doing with a racial, cap, racial analysis and a labor analysis in any type of organizing you're doing, because then you can understand the, the history of whatever you're dealing with, right? And how it connects to a, variety of a, a wider we of people, you know what I'm saying? And also include gender as well and all this other stuff. The second thing I would say is also is that I think that, you know, we have to really support, you know, um, spaces of, of organic intellectual development. I think that one of the things that was so amazing about, the, you, know, you know, Connor's books in the 1960s, 1930s, even the 1990s was that, you know, and even today, there's always a sense of the organic intellectual. Right, the intellectual that's outside of the system, that's that's creating, that's writing, that's teaching. You know, we all have people in our neighborhood who's always teaching, always doing stuff. I remember at CUNY, I can't always go back, but you know, we call ourselves the conscious backpackers, right? You know, I'm saying we were rappers, we were like artists, but you know, in that backpack, you know, we had copies of Fanon. We might have a videotape, you know, saying of the spooky sat next to the door or the Battle of Algiers, and wherever we were. We were plugging that in to be like, we're doing political education right now. You need to watch this right now. We had a tape. Here, you need to listen to this tape. You know what I'm saying? So how do we re return to that, but also support the institutions that exist right now, right? I can name them all. There's a People's Forum. There's Mayday, there's Mayday Space over in Bushwick. I'm the new executive director of Mazel Cinema. We're a micro, we're a micro cinema in Harlem that, that does... Um, social justice documentaries. We're right on 125th Street and, and Lenox Avenue, right in the heart of Black Harlem. And you know, on all the films that we offer are a suggested donation. That means if you don't have money, you get to see the film. Culture for free, right? And so, you know, support, so, you know, you know, so if you find organizations like that, support them, you know what I'm saying? And if you don't see an organization like that, then, cr then create it. And, you know, and, and it's okay, you know, the thing about it, sometimes we look at these organizations and, you know, it's okay to, it's okay to create an organization and for them to close, right? We need to learn something from these weed shops. They open up and they close again, they open up and they close again. Sometimes, like, we need to have cultural organizations that do the exact same thing. They open up, they serve a need, they close, they reopen up another different name. So, you know, so if you just, there's so many churches and so many synagogues and mosques in our communities the demand that they, they want people to use their space. They want people in there. So you can go in there and be like, I'm doing a four week university on the history of XYZ. And then you open it, you bring people together, you close it, then you reopen it again to something else. What is the needs of the community? You know, and, it, and, you know, and I think that everybody has that ability to organize because one thing I learned, and you know, I always say, and, and it's actually in this quote is in this book right here. We should just get a copy of it right here, New York Liberation School. The quote is in the book that that you know one of the core lessons of our movements is that even if they take away our universities, even if they take away our, they, they, they really try to take away our neighborhoods, 
even if they, if they try to take away the things that are important to us, they're still embodied within us. You know what I'm saying? We still carry it with us. And, we, and, and as long as we carry it with us, we can rebuild it. You know what I'm saying? So Black Harlem, what I grew up in, it's still very much embedded in me, and I know it, and I take it everywhere I go. You know what I'm saying? In terms of my value structure, in terms of who I am as intellectual, and who I be, right? And I'm always trying to rebuild it, and that's part of the organic intellectualism. You build from the ground up, and I think that that's sort of the thing, but I think we need to be much more demanding of our demands, and just say, say, say hey, we need to follow the money and start making some demands that they start paying for some of this stuff and so that, you know, we can live a little better life. So that's what I think. And do you want to close it out? Yeah, so I guess I'll answer the, <laughs> the Sanders question, um, which is, I, I mean, I'll do that first and then maybe talk about other things. But um, yeah, I mean, what we were, what we were doing, what we were building was this horizontal, directly democratic experiment, right? That rejected representation. And we were very clear about that in all the collective statements that were written, like that passed, you know, through consensus in the General Assembly and then the Spokes Council and then meetings after. Um, and also the, the context of the 2011 movements was very much you know, in that vein, people were doing similar kinds of projects. So um, the Sanders campaign knew that. <laughs> um, and then they chose to use the, the rhetoric of the 99% and the 1% and to fold people in from the movement. Um, so I do think that that qualifies as co-optation. Um, not that, you know, there wasn't some benefit to more people talking about class. Um, or more people getting engaged, you know, in different kinds of projects as a result of, you know, of the campaign. Like, all of that's true, but, yeah. But they did co-opt our stuff. <laughs> um, and they were pretty blatant about it. Um, we tried to talk to them about it. Um, didn't really get an, a sympathetic ear. So, uh, you know, it's too bad. But um, we keep building from below you know, um, building counter institutions, building spaces for people to realize their, their own agency and potential um, and to meet their needs. And, um, you know, I've, I've been for the last eight years part of MAC, the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council, um, and we do assemblies and working groups and mutual aid. And um, my favorite thing that we do is this care exchange where people come and they, they bring their, their offers and their requests. And we, we, we basically, you know, we have this interdependence as a result of, of this exchange. Um, and, you know, not every need is met. <laughs> um, but it does... Um, get a, get out of this kind of uh, service orientation where like you know you think that that you don't have anything to to offer you're not you know you're not good enough you're not valuable like in in this world and um, so knowing that everyone has something something to give even if it's small um, yeah I think that that's that's a really great space that that we've created um, and. Yeah, on this, um, let's see, the question of, well, demand, I feel like I should, I should talk about the demands thing. Um, yeah, I mean, demands only, um, they'll only hear us if we, if we create our own spaces <laughs> and our own movements, right? I mean, that's, that's the thing. Like, you, you don't get concessions um, by only doing this, like, inside strategy, right? Um, or by making empty demands. You actually have to have power <laughs> in order to, to get any of those material resources back. Um, so, you know, regardless, we have to build like, you know, rank and file militant labor movements and, you know, um, community spaces and build, build our autonomy um, and, and take it, you know, take those, those resources. So anyway, that's what I, I think occupation is. Occupation doesn't have to be um, a, a space, like a public space where people are <laughs> having these kinds of conversations. It can also be like, you know, occupying an institution, transforming the institution um, so that it actually meets the, the needs of the people in it. Um, 
that's that's what I hope that we can do here at CUNY. And um, yeah, I'm I'm just happy that we we met tonight and had these conversations. So we are just about at time. I want to thank again each of our amazing panelists for this. I know I learned so much. <laughs> Humbled and honored to be up here with folks and be able to learn from folks. Um, I also want to kick it over back to Sarah, who has some more announcements for us before we adjourn for tonight. Thank you all so much, um, our speakers, our audience. Um, Marissa and Coco have copies of their books for sale. Uh, there's also a QR code, and they have some physical copies with them here, so make sure to connect, check those out. They're on the table next to all the flyers. Um, also, for SLU students, we have a select number of copies of Coco's book that we are able to share out for free to students. They, in the very CUNY way, they are still on their way and not physically here yet, so if you connect with Zara, she'll take uh, names, emails, so that we can make sure they get to you when they do arrive. Uh, fingers crossed later this semester that we'll be getting them to you and not mailing them in the summer. Um, and again, thank you to everyone who attended tonight, to all the folks on the live stream, and so much gratitude and appreciation to our speakers for being here tonight. <laughs>